It's probably good we have one other person on the side. Hmm? I will keep my phone on just in case because Luke, Luke needs to get a hold of me because he is monitoring it from home. Mm -hmm. So my phone goes off just that. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it off. That, not that many important people get a hold of me. Right. Um, so, you ready? Wait, we gotta start with that. Pledge. Pledge. Open the meeting, yes. All right, everyone, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance before we start our budget workshop. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Please, Mr. Schultz, begin our 2021-22 budget with no action to do. Perfect. Um, it's my sixth year doing this, so we did. It, we decided to go about this in a little different approach. We usually sit down and we go expense line by expense line within the first meeting, in, which can be kind of dragged out. Uh, it can also be very difficult because we're kind of working with expenses still that we really don't know uh, the true nature of yet because we're still kind of meeting and trying to find out uh, what the needs are of the district. It's still kind of early. So what we decided to do for this meeting is really focus on revenue. Revenue is really the big piece that we've talked about for the last 12 months. Uh, by the way, this the pandemic of this district would have really taken effect about 12 days. It would be a, a full year, so March 13th. But we've talked about revenue constantly, not really expenses, uh, only because there's so much uncertainty out there with the state. Uh, so we figured we would take some time. I know with James being new and, and Kim being new also, we can take some time to kind of go over that big side of that but budget first, and then go over the expenses at the next meeting, and then try to match those two together, and then come up with something that the, the district can look at. So, um, just to go over the basics, any kind of municipality, like a school district, we have to have a balanced budget. Revenues equal expenses. Revenues come from multiple uh, agencies. I'll go over that in a second, but it just has to balance on both ends. So we make sure we do that first and foremost. Usually go for the revenue side first, it's much easier. We get those aid runs in January from the state of New York. We can then start to figure out our tax cap after that. So we usually have our revenue side figured out pretty quickly. It's the expense side that takes much longer. Revenues can't change also because the state, of course the governor's proposal comes out in January. They go back and forth, they argue who's got more money, who's gonna give more money, and then usually we can, they find a, kind of a common ground around March. I'm hoping that happens again. I would say without stimulus package, there's probably not a lot left to go around. Um, but now that we do have a stimulus package that passed the House, I think it was Saturday or Sunday, uh, there will be some, hopefully some more money allocated to the state. The original talk was a $15 billion increase. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what they're looking at, about a 12.9 right now. And I, I spoke last week at the board meeting. The tax revenue for New York State uh, is about almost two billion higher than originally anticipated. So there's a little glimmer of hope there that'll come back to the districts also. Uh, timeline: We have four upcoming bud uh, public budget sessions. We don't necessarily have to use all of them if we find that we're kind of after tonight. We don't have no inf new information going into next Monday. We don't have to sit down to do this again. We can do it two weeks out instead of next week. Um, but usually by this board adopts the budget at the March board meeting. Usually we have all our numbers by then. We can go a little further out than that, that's okay. But we usually we, we've been able to kind of collect that to, and have it ready by the end of March. And then we have, it's the uh, third Tuesday of every May is the budget vote. I anticipate the budget vote will be normal, unlike last year uh, where everything was a mail-in. Uh, there has been no discussion from the state or the governor about going back to that approach. So I think if we can do it with social distancing and we've got that figured out, we will have it and conduct it here in person. So as we get more information on that, I'll be, be able to share it. Um, revenues, uh, taxes are the big, one of the, taxes and state aid are the two biggest pieces of this budget, we make up well over 90%. Um, taxes, we are limited to a 2% tax cap, as you well know, that 2% tax cap is not always 2%. I've seen it higher, I've seen it much lower, I've seen it negative before. We're at about a 1.5%, 1.54% tax cap for going into next year. So if we wanna go above that cap 
And now mind you, we've on average in the last 10 years, our tax levy has been a 1.6% increase. That's average over 10 years. If we want to go any higher than that, you need a 60% majority, super majority to pass that. This district, I don't think, has ever had to do that. Uh, I have been a part of them. They're not very fun. Um, but you have an option to do that, and you, you would just need, like they just call it, breaking the tax cap. A lot of that tax cap is based on growth in the area, which is set by the state. Uh, it's also based upon what kind of aid you see as far as building aid and any kind of capital aid and how many capital, the capital expenses that you have going out. But it's a pretty in-depth formula, but one point, I would say 1.5%, you're not breaking tax cap, you're staying a little below, but it's a modest increase. So. State aid, um, based upon a lot of expense-driven aids, and I'll go over those in a minute, and then there's also foundation aid, which makes up the majority of our total aid package. That aid, foundation aid, has been talked about a million times. It's based upon actual attendance values back from 2008-2009. That was a, a formula that they set up. They set up, and we're supposed to increase each year. And then the fiscal crisis hit, and they kept it exactly status <laughs> quo. They talked about changing that formula, but that is off the table at this point. So, and I haven't heard any kind of rumbling or uh, regarding that. The foundation aid makes up the most of it. Uh, about state aid. We're about probably state aid alone is around nine million a year, give or take. So. Pilot revenue. Pilot revenue is payment in lieu of taxes. Those are um, companies that work with the IDA to set up new businesses, and they get what they end up doing is getting a tax exemption or tax break for a specified number of years. They pay a certain percentage of the total tax levy. Uh, that comes to the district as cash. It's not part of the levy itself, which is a little different. So it comes in as another as a, as a revenue stream, an additional revenue stream. When that pilot agreement ends, they become part of the rolls, they call it, or the tax levy. So they get absorbed into that once it's done. They usually run anywhere from 10 to 20 years, uh, maybe even longer. I don't know if I've ever seen anything longer than that. Basically, it's promoting new business coming in. Uh, our pilot revenue has increased in the last couple of years only due to the fact of the nursing home coming online. Uh, we have about four other ones, smaller uh, pilots that are attached to the district, but the nursing home is one of the larger ones. Others, uh, interfund transfers, that would be Kellogg money coming into the district or coming into the general fund to offset the budget. Uh, tuition from other districts, which is usually from any type of um, foster student placement. Uh, so we will charge back to districts so that students from the, the district of origin. We also have interest revenue off of our investments, which is just basically savings accounts. We don't invest in stocks or bonds or any long-term investments. We can do short-term notes, three to six months, but that's about all we do. Uh, and we have reserves. We have about seven different reserves right now. I didn't list them all. Debt reserve, workers' comp reserve, TRS liability. That's money that we have saved throughout the years and built into separate savings accounts. Those reserves are allocated and only to be used for certain things. TRS liability, exactly as it states, we pay teachers' retirement system each year. We can take money out of that reserve and help pave that bill each year, but we can only use it for that. We can't use it to buy books or do anything else besides of that. Then we have fund balance. Fund balance, we, every year that we have, we save money. If we have money that offset, we underspend our budget. We have what's called fund balance. It gets dumped into one big lump sum at the end of the year, and then we can allocate that back into our reserves. Really not supposed to, you can, you're allowed to hold about 4% of your budget and then anything above that 4%, you have to allocate to reserves. So, any questions about revenues? Good. Just a quick uh, snapshot of that, what we see, like I was saying, state aid and uh, taxes alone make up about 90%. Pilot revenue is less than a half a percentage point. Uh, reserves about almost a little shy of two. And fund balance is a little over 4%. So majority, I mean, anytime you see any kind of shifts in state aid, any decreases or increases, it has a huge impact to the district and a huge impact to the budget, especially any kind of decrease. It can have a really very quick tri uh, trickle effect. Um, so when I talked about aid runs, the January aid run that came out, uh, seems like each year the state wants to try something different or we have some kind of fiscal crisis going on. Or This year they decided that they would take a lot of the expense-driven aids 
But when I talk about expense driven aids, I talk about like BOCES aid, transportation aid, private access or high cost aid. These are expense driven aids. These are what happens is we spend the money this year only to turn around and get the aid in the following year based upon a percentage of what we are allowed to receive. So transportation aid, so for example, would be we spend $1,000 in transportation, we get about 52, 53% of that back in the following year. You have to expend it first before you can get it back. So these are expense driven aids. Private excess costs and high cost aid are attached to student uh, special education services. We have a threshold that we hit, anything above that threshold we get aid back on. BOCES aid, exactly the same thing. We, we spend in BOCES, we have aid ratios that follow each of those expenses and then the next year we receive that in aid. Textbook, library, and hardware aid are all based upon student count. So they may, they'll allocate and say, for every student, we're gonna get $50 for library. That's not expense driven, that's just a set cost for every district. What they decided to do this year, now building aid is also called expense driven also because you're incurring debt. Anytime we do a building project, we get aid back on that. That's part of the aid package, total aid package. So the one, two, three, four, these right here, building aid, high cost, private access, transportation, and BOCES aid, we're all decided to lump together into one. The state thought it would be a great idea, it would be less of a hassle to we'd put everything into one aid category. Here's your aid, uh, one lump sum. Looks great on paper, but the fear is that a lot of things will get hidden in that or taken out, and you don't have a way of figuring that out. So they look at it as we think we're going to do you a favor. We look at it as I don't think that's a favor. I, I would rather see this broken out so I can see exactly in BOCES aid what I'm going to receive, and does that seem skewed to me or not? For this coming budget that we're doing right now, they just changed that just now. They're, they're. Um, how do I want to say this? They're trying it out. How about that? It, well, it, it hasn't been officially changed yet. That's how it was conceptualized in the January aid runs that that came out. However, you can easily disaggregate and see how your district compares if it was disaggregated or lumped into one. Um, the the other piece that you risk is lack of of making informed decisions as to how you expend uh, different different items into each of those expense-based driven aids each year, which gives you some degree of control in the following year and predictability to, uh, to a, a more sensitive degree than just a traditional lump sum. Uh, so right now there are many, many advocacy groups who are advocating to not clump them together in that way, but in the final runs that come out in April, that what you see listed here is how that should appear. So the 21-22 uh, revenue estimates that Mr. Schultz has listed there is based on disaggregating that from those January runs. And it will be the same? If they lump together, separate it all out, so the same amount of money total or no? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily okay. because um, the distribution is a little different. <laughs> Sorry. And there are, no, that's why I know it's a good question. Yeah. And the kind of seconds, I can jump in. Yeah. Yeah, and it's getting it's getting in the weeds a little bit to explain yeah. you know how the calculations differ between each of those, okay. um, but the long term effects of that are not advantageous to districts. So I've also heard, um, how does this affect BOCES programming and cutting back on the schools? What what am I hearing about that? I haven't heard anything regarding that. I need to go back to an email. I got something um, mm -hmm. from our union at my school. It was, wasn't specific to learning all these together. It had to do with BOCES and how the governor wants to change BOCES. I haven't heard anything regarding I think my wife might have received the same thing. Yeah. Um, but it was, I, I couldn't really figure out why. BOCES it was just an advocacy for BOCES not to, not to lump them together, but I don't see any change. So I guess it's with programming or who's responsible for it or something. You know, I would see that. Okay. You know, if, if you want to share that with me, yeah. I can look at it and get okay. more specifically okay. what they're talking about. I think it actually came out from the state union. And then I can let you know. And the national union and then uh, filter down to our union. Yeah, yes. would you mind shooting that sure. to me? Sure. And then I can get an answer for you? Sure. That'd be great. One of the things that I don't like about lumping them all together, and I'll tell you right now, is that if you look at our aid runs right now, the transportation aid for 21-22 is slated at like $730,000. We've never received anything over probably $450,000 in the transportation aid. We didn't change anything this year. 
We didn't change anything. We're not going to change anything next year to receive almost a $300,000 increase. Those aid ratios are sometimes, not that the aid ratios are skewed, but the calculations sometimes get skewed. And so you see some well, those those aid runs, we are very meticulous to look at each one to make sure that they're correct. I mean, if I get a BOCES aid, if I have a BOCES number that's saying we're gonna get $700,000, I'm gonna go back and calculate each thing that we have spent out to make sure that that's aligned correctly. And I'll bet you 99% of the time it's not. What we do is we back off and get more conservative with those, with those estimates. So transportation, if you were to pull, if you pulled the aid in the runs right now and you look, my numbers would not match theirs. And I'll tell you right now, because of that transportation and because of BOCES, they're overinflated. So you overinflate the revenue, everything looks great, you go to build your budget and you don't get that aid next year, you're scrambling and now you're in a, in a deficit. So, you know, we, we go back and calculate out, get a conservative number, sometimes a little lower, just to make sure that we have that, we hit that mark. We don't want to be underestimating revenues at this point. So. And we've done that in a real informed approach. We've taken a look at the, and so year to year over the past five years, we've taken a look at what we had anticipated based on these runs, but then what actual expenditures were in each of those expense-driven aid lines. So we have a really good sense of how close or how disparate those figures were, and that helps to inform our decision-making as we start to conceptualize and build our expectations for revenues as we are <coughs> comparing those against anticipated expenditures. So it allows us to really make it a more, a more, I guess, scientific, a more targeted approach to determining what those estimates are, how close those estimates should be. What, what is the high cost aid? So what happens is you have a student who has special education <laughs> services and then they have OT, speech, everything, and that basically stacks on top of those, those costs that end up rising. What they do is they have a threshold. So every district has their threshold. Our threshold's around $45,000. And so anything above that cost, then you get aided on. Anything below it is not aidable at that point. So those are for high need students. It's only 50% above that. So but it is age driven. That's, you know, so when they file stacks for each student who has an IEP, then that stuff has got to get back. That goes to the state level and then gets calculated. Um, building aid is basically flat. I mean, they're looking at, we have a little, ch few changes in building aid, right? I mean, actually, not building aid. We have a few changes in building aid expenses, but nothing. With the same aid is going into next year. Our principal is a little higher, our interest is a little lower on a few, so it basically is stand as flat. Um, but I feel, you know, we feel very comfortable about these numbers, especially for transportation and BOCES. Mm -hmm. Transportation is still running. There's, you know, there's a little bit of back and forth right now whether or not they're going to fund previous year's uh, transportation regarding for food delivery. Um, the state had pushed it as a mandate, you have to feed students while we were uh, locked down. Uh, we did, and then turned around, and they've been saying, well, maybe we're not going to aid you for that. I think that that has kind of gone to the wayside, and I think they've realized that they have to do something. So, um, uh, so. so as we go forward, back around 2008-2009, you started to see the recession start to take effect. Um, there's fear right now that we're going to go back into that kind of world again, as far as the way state. No, where is it? Like that. Right. Um, so what happened back in 2010 was. We were in a recession, we started to hit it pretty hard. Uh, what was different about this, that recession compared to, we're not in a recession right now, we're in a pandemic, but what happened there was, in here you had TRS and ERS costs went through the roof. Uh, so we had, we have, we're not seeing that now. The market, which is ERS and TRS retirement funds are sitting in currently, we're not seeing the market take the drop that we did back then. But I will say we're still seeing now, still a revenue problem. We're still having that. If you see here, this blue part is federal sources. This is when jobs restoration money came through. Uh, 
I'm trying to remember, um, stimulus package came through. This was federal money, and they, if you notice, that was quite an, uh, usually stays pretty flat most of the years. Huge increase here, little decrease, and then it started to dip down. And if you notice, the state level started to dip down also. What we anticipate happening is you see stimulus package came through for this year. You've got another stimulus package possibly, hopefully, going into next year, and then that's it. And then from there, the state still is short cash. They don't have any way of getting it from the federal government, so they're going to cut more into the state funding. We saw that was called gap elimination adjustment. Went on for years, I think eight years probably. As you see, it started to kind of rise right in here, but again, federal sources stayed flat. Uh, so we kind of, that's what we're anticipating happening. And that point, what happens is, then we got to really look at how are we going to fund going into the, the you know, 23, 24, 22, 23, I think should be okay too. 21, 22, I'm not as worried. Like I said, we have money that's coming in. 22, 23, and then, but this is going to be a four year deal. That's what they anticipate. And they've already said about 80 million or 80, you know, 80 billion in the hole for, or 64, I'm sorry, 64 billion for four years. So, um, that's what we have to prepare for. It's not only preparing for next year, but doing an analysis of also fund balance, and that's our reserves going into the next four years and how we would fund if there were cuts made. Now, there were talk of, you know, earlier on a year ago, a little less than a year ago, about 20% cuts. Those have gone away. So we're not facing that right now, especially building a budget, which was almost impossible to do to try to guess on those kind of cuts. But still, I, I still foresee once we get through 21-22, most likely stimulus package will dry up and then we'll be stuck with some kind of adjustment each year by the state education department. So it'll be important for this board to consider when we're looking at various sources of revenue, which are those that we know will drop off in the next year or two that are tied directly to any stimulus package that may exist. Because if you look at the historical trend, you, you can quickly see if you're basing on you know history repeating itself, what happens to those federal stimulus dollars? And so we need to be thinking, what are those expenditures that are sustainable over one or two years budgets, and which ones um, are not? So that we are, and at the same time, understanding what remain our core priorities from an instructional perspective that, that really um, drive our expenditure budget, that we, need to be planful for so that we can make sure that we do sustain long term. So this is a very telling representation which illustrates exactly that. And it's offset by, is that local and state sources, yeah. right, of yeah. revenue as well? So you can not only look at the balance, what happened in the federal dollars coming through, but also how that was balanced and adjusted by a change in, in local and state sources of revenue as a result of that. It just it helps with the forward planning. You know, you're also you're stuck in a situation too because you can't. Not only are you going to have we will be in a situation where we're going to have adjustments done to state revenue and state aid, but now you have a two percent tax cap or less. Right. So right. You, you know your areas of trying to gain pound. I mean, when they did this before, back you know when they were giving people were going out for seven percent tax levies, fifteen percent tax levies, and getting you know they were able to do it. Not saying to do that. Um, but you know, it's, but they were so now. I mean, and, and now so you're a little tighter each time, and, and now we're very much constricted as far as what we can do and how we can plan out. One of the good things about some of the talk right now is some of the stimulus package and aid that is coming through. They're talking and saying, well, "Listen, can you give it to districts and let them spend it over a three-year span instead of a twelve-month span?" That's the way it was before. Here's your money. Here's four hundred thousand, but you have to spend it in twelve months. Basically, what districts did was they took and they took your salary and your salary and your salary and reallocated it to these funds, and that was all they did. So hopefully, the talk right now is to say, listen, give us the money, but let us take time to spend it. So we're going to allocate 100 each year to the budget so it's not this big cyclic pattern. Or a big funding clip. Right. The other option, too, is to, is to open up those reserves that I talked about. And what they had suggested, one of the um, rules this year was that you could use reserve, let's say it's TRS, let's say it's, for, it's a retirement reserve, but I needed to buy or pay off debt. They said, well, you can do that, but you have to pay it back with interest and you have to do it in a specified amount of time. 
they're saying they're talking right now. Let us do that, but don't penalize us for doing it. And we, you know, and increase the time frame of paying it back. Maybe it's ten years instead of two years. So there is a little bit of chatter right now at the state level and between, you know, different stakeholders about trying to ease the tension because we don't really have a lot of areas to, to grapple. So. And this isn't doom and gloom. I'm just saying let's prepare long term for it. That's all. As we build expenditures, uh, a lot of the budget's based upon fixed and uh, variable costs. The fixed costs greatly outweigh the variable. We are, you know, of course, we have contracts with uh, staffing and personnel, long-term debt. We have fuel prices, uh, whether it be heating fuel or everything. So those, I would say we probably have a good handle of, uh, on almost all of our fixed costs right now. All of our contractual obligations. Contractual obligations. We did get our fuel bids in last week. We saw a couple of cents per gallon on one side and you know about six cents more on another side of heating fuel and diesel. So not bad. I mean, I've seen worse and we lock in on that fixed price. We don't do a variable, we do a fixed. Uh, so we know what we're going into. Contractual is all set. We have, like I said, long-term debt. Working on special education right now, that's probably a little bit bigger. Uh, we end up, we tend to kind of pad that a little bit just to ensure that we don't, you know, there's a lot of fluctuation throughout the year. We've been, we try to make sure that we're um, pretty close to it. Um, this budget is based upon a full back to normal, maybe not normal, I shouldn't say that, but let's say five days a week with all students back. This is not based upon the current situation right now. Uh, we would still budget and purchase PPE equipment if needed, but we will budget accordingly for that too. So this is, like I said, this is for a all kids back, everything is at least we're going five days a week on a regular schedule. Um, and then from here, we just basically will align, we'll look at our expenses. That's the next step. Like I said, a lot of our expenses are done, and I'll show you a quick snapshot of what we're looking at. Uh, we, one of the things we just received, teachers just sent in uh, their requests. We did a zero-based uh, budgeting approach with the teachers, kind of similar to what we've done in the past, but just a little bit more detailed, I think. We were allocating money each year to teachers just as a starting point. This year we're going to start more at a zero zero percent or zero base. I have to look at those and review those. We'll put together and compile all those together. We're kind of you know, conference requests, field trips, textbooks, things like that. We'll do that in the next week, um, and then we should have a pretty good budget to go with within the next probably seven to ten days. Let's see. So a uh, real quick snapshot of the budget right now. Um, this is just a summary page that takes the major codes and compiles them all together. Uh, we're looking at 21-22 on a 1.6% increase in spending, 1.7%, and then a 1.5% tax levy like I talked about earlier. It stays below the tax cap. Um, with that kind of configuration, we're still about $160,000 deficit. Now, I'm not saying there's we have taken a lot of stuff and rolled it over just because we're still compiling those numbers. So I think there's a lot of wiggle room in there. Um, so I don't, when I, when I say, and I get up in front and speak to the board during board meetings, I say I don't sleep. I've been in much worse situations of half a million dollars and you're like, okay, this is not gonna be good. This is doable. These are areas that we can look at and hopefully, you know, long range forecasting and things like that we can handle. Uh, so I'm not really worried about it. I'm also not worried about it if another stimulus package comes through you'll see an aid increase. Where that aid gets put, I don't know if they're gonna increase foundation aid. Now mind you, foundation aid, which was the $6.1 million number, has been frozen for, was frozen last year into this year and is now still frozen from this year into next year. That's where I think they'll probably kill the money. So, but that's still, you're still out on it. Considering that we have not really nailed down a lot of the detail you know, surrounding our instructional needs and, and taking a look at all the classroom requests and those types of things. To be this close, this early out of the gate, uh, is phenomenal. It, it truly, truly is. So, uh, Carrie's done a great job putting all this together. The, uh, the other thing too is we, you know, we're keeping kind of some of the similar assumptions based upon revenue right now. We have, we had talked about uh, reserves, you know, we're using, we're using fund balance, which is going to be savings from this year, and to offset the budget for next year, plus the reserves 
we have about $250,000 in reserves that we spend out there. Basically, one of those things, of course, TRS liability, we take a little money from that, we allocate it. Right now, our budget is a little underspent to where it would normally be. So as far as going into the remainder of the year, I feel confident, again, that we're going to be at a 96% spending rate of the budget. So you're not going to be tight as far as you know budget and expenses almost matching and almost being overspent. So right now, our numbers are still low. So. Okay. How many anticipated, I know it's just a ballpark of, um, of retirements do you have factored in? Uh, I have none factored into this right yet. Now, so let me rephrase that. I have five. So <laughs> I should know, I, as I said. So we have a, there's a budget line, uh, 2110, one, uh, 110 is the budget line. And that's into, that which we have to do, we have to budget for, if you decide to retire at the end of this year, we're on the hook, for, of course, for your retirement incentive, which is basically contractual amount based upon the days on of service that you have still in the books. So we budget for five. So you don't want to get into July 1st and all of a sudden we've approved a budget and three people say, I'm going to go, and then you're up on the hook for... It does 000. not mean that five people have announced no. their retirements. No. Right. No, I was just wondering what we had sure. anticipated. Do they have a date they have to do that by? They do. I believe it is May 1. Uh, I think it, no. I think it's more, actually, is it March or May? Is it March. I think it's March, actually. I, okay. It's a good question. I should I have that answer. I don't That's know. Okay. Like, sure. I'll like, all these dates. Um, it, now, they... If they don't put it in by the, it's not that they don't get it, it's the fact that the district can withhold it for the next year. Oh, don't put the incentive the next year? Yeah, it's not a, it's not a, um, we don't have an incentive here or, or a rule here that it's, if you, the first year you hit it, you yeah. get it or you oh, don't. Okay. No, it's not like that. Okay. It's just basically the way it's spent out okay. the timing. Okay. Um, I don't, you know, right now, um, that could be anything. It could change tomorrow, so. Uh, we're going to continue to review expenses. That's the next big thing. Re revenue side of it is really we're waiting on the state. That's the next thing we have. And, and I haven't heard a lot of chatter. I think once the stimulus bill gets packed, passed, then you're going to hear, then they'll start, they'll come out with another set of aid runs. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot more aid to, to really recoup. It's going to be expenses that we're going to start looking at and taking the scalpel to or looking at what we want to add. What I'll have next time is I'll have, again, our analysis of just our reserves. And then we can kind of sit down and say, okay, not just this year, but the next year's going forward, if we end up in a situation where it's a quarter million gap, where can we take that money from? You know, just some kind of ways to, to look at scenarios. And uh, in case we have to weather the storm for a couple of years and we're not, and we're getting eight cuts that are more than we anticipated, that would be the next step I would take. At that point too, as we get towards the end of the month, we have a better feel of exactly where we're standing with expenditures. Uh, it's tough to, you know, in November to say, oh, I think we're here, we can make an educated guess. But once we get four to three months, three to four months out from the end of the school year, we got we usually have a really good idea of where we stand. And that will, anticipate, that will also help us to, to figure out, are there things that we can purchase out of this year's budget, out of this year that would go into next year's budget and reduce that deficit? So we have one uh, workshop scheduled for next Monday. <clears throat> we'll kind of wait and see. I don't know. We can probably still hold it. We'll decide in the next couple of days if that's going to stay or not. The next couple of days, yeah. yeah. You know, unless we have some, um, you know, land breaking information from the state uh, that we're aware of. Really, the next work on our part now is digging a little deeper into those expenditures and making sure that those recommendations continue to be aligned with our goals long term where we want to go as a district. Um, I use the phrase today that a budget is a numeric representation of your instructional priorities. Um, and uh, it, it truly is. So we'll be talking more about our instructional goals uh, through the rest of this year, through the summer, um, and into the fall. And if there are any implications for changes in expenditure lines to support that year's budget. Um, in March, you will be hearing the larger presentation on our student performance over the course of this year, uh, what implications that may lead us to in terms of summer programming, 
um, in some additional programming for next fall to address any learning gaps uh, that, again, I would argue we have to be careful in how we conceptualize what we define as learning gaps and how we're measuring those. Um, but regardless, we need to be looking at summer programs this year um, and some compensatory programs most likely in the fall to support that. Um, that's really the, the depth of thinking so far, but that's big picture where we're headed um, as we are you know, getting uh, deeper into the expenditure side of the budget. And as far as expenses go, I mean, like let's talk about the larger expenses. Healthcare is a very, very big expense here roughly $4 million of the budget, that is actually, both dental and health insurance are not going up for next year. I'm not saying that you won't see an increase in somewhere within that line. Sometimes you have people coming into retirement or increases because of you know, little changes here and there, but that's almost two years in a row we've had that. Um, I think that the increase on average in the last five years has probably been one and a half or less. So we've done very well. TRS and ERS will go up a little bit, not huge. There's still, TRS is still staying a little under 10%. I was talking about the recession back in 2009, 2010, 2008. They, um, if I remember correctly, ERS was around 18%. TRS was around 14%. When you're talking about, you're taking that percentage off of the total salaries, that's what you give back to the state. So, some pretty big hits, and right now we're not seeing that. It usually lags about 18 months, so the market's still doing well. I don't see it even forecasted out to the next year and a half. Any questions? Very simple approach this year. So, good summary. Well, you know, it's it's it makes sense to streamline, but I think it's also important that our community and certainly our board have a thorough understanding of the revenue side of budget development. That's not just about raising taxes. It's not just about you know expended you know expending uh, money in, in different places and who's asking for what money where. That's that's really is not the focus. The focus is truly understanding where you know how school districts are funded. And the latitude that as a board you have in determining the flow of those funds and how those help to inform the decisions that we make in developing that expenditure side. So that I'm hoping that we have our community tuning in because when they come to the polls to vote, we want to position them to be able to make an informed decision and to truly understand what it is that they are, are voting for um, and have opportunities to hear our thinking right from day one. So that's that's bigger picture why we've opted to take this approach this year. But if we're going sideways and there's something that you're expecting that you're not getting, please let us know. And we're happy to tailor uh, this approach to bring you any information that you need as we're working through it. Good. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, thank yes. you so much. Well done. As always. <clears throat> That's yeah. it for tonight. Yeah. All right, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Lucy and Kim. Yeah. All right. And Mr. Schultz is going to take us off the live stream. Okay. Thank you.